So uh, John Loomis and I are going to uh, step back and uh, show you some of what we've learned in, uh, in the United States. Okay, so um, we had to get on the map and figure out what was uh, the other side of the equator. I have not been down here before and I really appreciate the invitation. Uh, you can see from the map, the map we're going to talk about two projects in, Cal in uh, the United States, Cal Academy in California, uh, Library of Packard Campus in um, uh, Virginia. And uh, after lunch, we're going to come back and talk a little bit about uh, Giant Interactive Group in China, a project that we've uh, just finished up. Um, that uh, may be easier for you guys to understand. <laughs> so uh, who's SWA Group? Um, uh, we, we started with uh, Peter Walker was a student of Hideo Sasaki at Harvard and the two of them developed a relationship back in the 50s. Uh, Pete was really the founder of the West Coast uh, SWA or Sasaki Walker Associates with Hideo back on the East Coast. Um, it didn't really take Pete very long to, or Hideo very long to decide he didn't want to have much to do with this uh, West Coast group. Uh, you can see Pete there by the 70s kind of leading his, his tour uh, of students and um, those happen to be our colleagues. Uh, John and I uh, are partners with those fellows uh, today. So we've had the benefit of working together for uh, over the last uh, 30 years. Uh, we currently have four offices in California and two offices in, in Texas and our newest office is in Shanghai. Uh, we tend to work regionally uh, where we think we have a little bit of understanding of the politics and the ecology of the place. Uh, so today, uh, we're going to talk about first Library of Congress uh, on the east coast of the United States and then California Academy of Sciences uh, um, this morning and then we're going to break for lunch and uh, we're going to come back and we're going to show you a movie, a 3D movie that uh, was produced for the Academy of Sciences and then we're going to talk about um, uh, the China uh, Giant Project. And just for reference, uh, I don't know if Jeremy is here or snoozing in the back, uh, that's Halifax where uh, Jeremy's going to talk tomorrow uh, about some of his, his landscapes. Uh, these two projects are, are very different. Uh, they have very different climates. Um, mostly uh, they differ from rainfall uh, in particular. Uh, California has a much uh, sim similar climate to uh, Australia here. We have dry summers and most of our uh, water is concentrated during the, the winter months. Certainly different building programs. Uh, one is an archive for audio visual um, uh, elements and the other one is archived for the collections of the Academy of Sciences. Very different budgets. The first one we're going to see uh, was like a hundred and sixty uh, million dollar budget and the uh, Cal Academy, you know, seven acres was closer to five uh, five hundred thousand dollars, five hundred million dollars. Uh, so first of all, who was David uh, Packard? Uh, David is the son of David Packard, who was partnered with Bill Hewlett and the heir to the um, Hewlett and Packard uh, 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 funds. Uh, David is a teacher of the classics, taught at UCLA, and realized that looking at culture through bits and pieces that had been collected over time that uh, you really didn't have a good understanding of one's culture. And he, he didn't want that to happen in the United States. Um, he felt that he had seen through his teachings and what was, was happening with computers that you could actually begin to digitize these things and really make a continuous story out of, out of one's culture. Um, he also happens to be a film buff and uh, it was his particular interest to, to protect and archive the films of the 19th century. So why Culpeper, Virginia? This is a sleepy little town, a uh, um, little Civil War town in uh, Virginia. Uh, it hasn't changed much actually since the 1860s. Uh, looks very similar uh, today. Uh, a lot of horse farms. I was able to spend uh, this past week up in Trentham with uh, Ed and Mel and it's very similar to that kind of landscape. Very rural, uh, lots of horses. Uh, but actually, Culpeper uh, did have a secret. It had uh, sort of a buried uh, treasure of sorts. Um, now I'm going to go back in time a little bit, back 
back in 1964, uh, Lyndon Johnson there, who just had succeeded um, John F. Kennedy, uh, authorized the Federal Reserve to build a bunker in, uh, in Culpeper. And that bunk bunker uh, was one of 12 Federal Reserve Banks. And the intention of these bunkers was to hold enough uh, money to jumpstart the economy in the event that uh, we had some national disaster. So it had about uh, $3 billion in coins uh, and currency uh, is, uh, hidden there. Um, so in 1997, David Packard uh, was looking for a place to archive his film and found this. <laughs> Uh, after David purchased, purchased it, it was later found that it was actually on Al-Qaeda's uh, hit list um, after 2001. They didn't know it had been decommissioned at that point. So um, the other thing uh, about this bunker was it was considered a continuity in government uh, site, which meant that in the event of a nuclear attack, uh, members of Congress uh, would come out to Mount Pony and they could, they could stay there and continue governing uh, for a 30, uh, I think it was for two months. They had uh, shelter and food. Uh, so effectively, the, one of the first green roofs in uh, the United States was a fallout shelter. So jumping ahead, 1997, um, uh, architects, the government, the United States, people just started thinking differently generationally. I think that's what's inspiring about Jeff's presentation is I think Australia is starting to think very differently about, about building and, and what we do. Um, and so we assembled a team with Packard Humanities that include, included BAR architects. They were the design architects. We had Smith Group uh, was the architect of record. We were selected as landscape architects. Um, DPR Construction and Outside and Limited was the, the landscape contractor. So we started thinking differently about landscape. Um, landscape ar architects typically uh, look, or we did in that generation, or I do, look back to history as references. And we got pretty good at making plants do what we wanted to do when we wanted to do it without any real thought of uh, life cycle costs. So um, we were from California, didn't know a whole lot about green roofs, didn't know a whole lot about uh, Culpeper, Virginia. Uh, but I was told to uh, speak with Ed Snodgrass, who was the local authority back there. And putting together our team, I kind of think a lot like putting together a band. So John and I were like lead vocals and drums, but we needed, you know, somebody on bass, and that was going to be uh, Ed Snodgrass. And I went back and met with Ed, and Ed showed me around his farm, showed me what he was doing in this depth of knowledge in green roofs, and it introduced me to a whole other uh, range of experts that got us thinking differently about this new landscape. So um, here's a site, 40 acres in rural uh, Virginia. Uh, the previous owner, of course, was the government who had um, basically planted it in lawn and trees so that there was uh, visual security uh, throughout the whole uh, property. Um, I'm going to walk you through the building program first. Uh, the entire site is uh, a, a building program is covered with green roofs, and each, each building is a little bit different. Our approach to uh, the buildings and the roofs was to take the entire 40-acre site and uh, effectively restore it, much like uh, the desal plant. So we had a lot of program on roof and a lot of program all off roof, and it was all designed to restore uh, the landscape back to its uh, native habitat. Um, you see the central um, pool there. Uh, the idea was to really focus the improved or manicured landscape around the areas that it was going to be most appreciated. That's the, that's the library conservation building on the project. So Ed introduced me to this fellow, Dennis Naparowski, who had uh, developed techniques for establishing native plants along uh, local stream corridors for water quality. And we set about uh, develop, or selecting about 10 native species to uh, revegetate the entire site. So we ended up planting over 10,000 um, liners of trees, 10 species, 10 feet on part, 10 feet apart, so that we could uh, manage the landscape below them. 
the upland meadow uh, was the open area below the conservation building, and that was effectively the borrowed landscape. The idea that you could sit in your uh, library cubicle, look out over the reflecting pool, and off to the uh, Blue Mountains in the distance over that meadow. Um, we were all also introduced to this fellow, Larry Weiner, who um, uh, developed a, a rich seed mix of local perennial meadow grasses and flowers uh, for seeding. And we set about um, um, building. Uh, so that was the first phase. This shows that we did uh, expand the parking area and provide services to the, to the new program. Uh, the collections building, that was the first building that was developed. Now these collections that come in are film uh, and, and very sensitive to humidity and temperature. So these vaults had to be kept at 30, 40 degrees and therefore that's why the buried, buried program. That's what the collections building you know, looks like. Ed was telling me that uh, they're just uh, overflowing with collections at this point. The government has to take these collections that people uh, bring uh, and process them at least to the point where they can reject them. So these are home movies that uh, uh, have been left in wills to the government. Uh, the central plant is just the central plant. It was, it was B and uh, extensive green roof behind the, uh, the earthen roof at the collections. The conservation building is really the main building that houses the librarians and is open to the public. Um, there's also a 150 seat theater uh, that screens archive films every Friday for the re residents of uh, Culpeper. This gives you a sense of kind of the open volumes. Um, you know, for a buried building, they really wanted this central library space to be very light and open to the central courtyard. You can see the movie uh, theater there tucked back into the corner. And the balcony uh, connecting the offices to the main conference rooms and the meadows. So the nitrate vaults, um, nitrate film is very dangerous. Uh, it, in, in warmer temperatures, it, it tends to uh, spontaneously combust um, and has to be kept at very, very cold temperatures. All of our films before 1951 were made of this nitrate film, and um, storing it is very a tricky, uh, tricky deal. So this had, a, had to have not only, um, well, here's a cross section. Um, the vault is on the left there with a deepened section of earth over it. So that earth all provides cooling for the building, but also is a, a ballast in the event of a blast. If any one of these vaults explodes, it is designed to shoot out the sides and up and out, but they want to have that weight on top so it uh, doesn't blow the roof off, if you will. So each of the vaults are individually monitored. You can kind of see how films would slide into those uh, different cubicles. And as I say, if one goes, it, it doesn't get into the next vault. Uh, mechanical room, again, is that little ext uh, extensive roof behind the, um, uh, behind the nitrate vaults. So total building square footage was 415,000 square feet. And um, the entire building is, is covered in green roof. So now I'm going to walk you through uh, the green roof component of it. Um, we worked with Ed uh, to develop a, uh, a sedum mix uh, over the uh, uh, conservation building, the idea that that was a, a large flat uh, roof that you couldn't see. So that's a six inch section of uh, expanded shale and uh, organic matter. And this is a, a view of that roof uh, looking back north to the Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, it's, it's completely covered with the exception of these skylights that look down into the courtyards and stairwells below. And then the, uh, the, um, the central plant and the uh, mechanical room, because you could see those, they're actually tipped at about 30 degrees, and you could see those uh, from the distance. We added some grassland into those uh, sedum mixes so that we could uh, make it transition better into the surrounding meadows. So you really can't see much of a difference between that roof and the, and the surrounding meadows behind. There's Ed uh, looking for his opportunities for habitat. Um, 
So the balance of the green roofs were intended to be amended topsoil, and um, they were up to 48 inches deep, totaling a, a total vegetated area of about 3.9 acres. And here's a, a diagram, the gray-green being the flat six-inch roof, the dark green, the tip eight-inch roof, and then the lighter greens and that pink-green piece are all the um, uh, native topsoil. So <clears throat> I'm going to show you some lessons learned through the construction period. As you know, landscape architects, as was mentioned, we oftentimes just show up at the end of the project when everything is done. And this, this project was almost uh, reversed. Uh, and we were not invited to the, to the first part of the project, but um, we ended up being asked in short order. So the collections building was the, the, the first phase, and that was going to be the rehabilitation of the um, existing building. So demolition uh, took place on that building. And you can see it's cleared for waterproofing and soil to come back onto it. And what had happened um, was the general contractor um, let contracts separately to, in phases. And the first phase was for this contractor. That contractor, the general contractor led to the roofing contractor. The roof, roofing contractor then subcontracted to the landscape contractor who was building, going to bring in all the topsoil. So I don't think John and I had even attended a, a, a site meeting yet on the project. Um, and they were just moving ahead. Here's the architect's drawing, um, which shows these, these well, 18 inch to 48 inch deepened soils on these uh, sloping roofs. I think the intention from the architect was just to put the existing soil back on there that was uh, taken off. And then we got a call. They, uh, they said, you know, we're having some cracks appear on the soil in, in the, on the roof. What's, what's going on here? And at that point, John and I really hadn't even been involved with the project, but we got involved very quickly at that point. Um, as they peeled some of the topsoil back, it was apparent that the soil was sliding and it was taking the waterproof membrane, insulation, drain mat uh, with it. So effectively, they had to take all that soil and, and pile it back off. So you can see from the site plan that there really hasn't been a whole lot of site development. As I said, we weren't even called out there. But we worked uh, very uh, readily uh, with the architect Smith Group to try to come up with a solution for how to repair the problem. Of course, at that point, everybody was uh, feeling particularly conservative. And um, I think the, the engineered solution was probably overkill, but um, it satisfied uh, uh, the team at the time. Here's a cross section. You can see the, the roof with the waterproofing ready to be rehabilitated. What they ended up doing is, um, is terracing it with lightweight concrete. So these are the forms that they came back in on top of the existing structure and uh, terraced that with lightweight concrete. Here is it waterproofed over the seasons, uh, winter season. We ended up losing about a year on the project uh, as a result of this. This was a $10 million insurance claim. Yeah, the, uh, it was the barristers and the insurance companies that really made out on this project. Um, and here you can see them spreading the lightweight uh, soil back onto those terraces. So at that point, we had been engaged with the architects pretty readily, the general contractor we were getting to know very well. And um, we were you know, endearing ourselves, I guess, to the, to the team getting ready for the next phase. So that ended up being a modified green roof over the collections, which was uh, nine inches deep of uh, or, or, um, permatil, which is an organic infused uh, inert material. And the lower uh, subsection uh, was just inorganic fill fines. So here we are in 2006. We started this project in 2001. So it had been a long haul. And um, I was inspired that the uh, desal plant got so far so quickly. But I know how painful it is to go through these, these different phases. So you can see the um, collections building is covered there. You can see behind it that the uh, central plant has the first phase of green roof planting on it. And again, the green roofs uh, led the charge on this, on this project. Here you can see that they are just blowing the soil up on the <coughs> conservation building. Uh, and nothing is really happening on the uh, nitrate vaults. 
So by June 2006, we were pretty well planted out uh, on the extensive roofs. And uh, these are some slides from early on. Um, we used this diverse mix of uh, plants that uh, we worked with Ed to develop. Um, and they got delivered to site and the contractor said, well, how are we going to maintain that kind of diversity? What's your idea? So we ended up taking sort of the percentage of plants that we had, throwing them in a wheelbarrow, and these guys ran string lines out and they just started plugging along these, along these roofs. So uh, you can see that pattern evolving out of this. So this is the first season of the green roof over uh, the central plant, uh, which we were pretty happy with. You can see the different species uh, growing in. Um, this is a mix of the three uh, competitors, disturbance-loving plants and the uh, stress-liking plants. And you can see them change over season through the winter. And then the next season, uh, in May of 2006, uh, we could start on the other roof. So um, this gives you some idea as we move through July and uh, uh, that the green roofs are growing, but we still haven't even gotten on site with our, our re restoration landscape. Roofs are coming along pretty strong. October, they're looking really good. We're, fo we're finally getting some grasses established on those, uh, those collections building. And then finally, uh, we're ready to, to start some of the tree planting. So the trees arrived in liners as well, and uh, we set about uh, planting them at a 10-foot grid. So come winter, uh, you can see the, the trees in tubes with the, um, the snow reflecting the weed cloth around them and a few of the pine plantings. There it is that same winter. And then come spring, the green roofs are really coming on pretty strong. You can see that the, the alliums and the sedums are doing very well. by April, still looking good. And then uh, finally, we started to get some of the, the manicured landscape in uh, towards the end of the year. You can see the reflecting pool still isn't complete yet. We haven't gotten the meadow planted, but you can see the, uh, the tree plantings uh, in the far distance. So I think this photo was taken in 2007. Um, and we sent our photographer back there in August, uh, October, I'm sorry, of 2007. So very quickly you can see the, um, the seeded material, seeded perennials coming in. You can see the trees still haven't emerged out of the tubes, but the perennials are holding tight. Um, vines are appearing on the, on the building. It was the architect's intention that this um, building selectively emerge from the landscape. And then the final uh, um, landscaping around the reflecting pool. It really is quite beautiful from in inside the building to look out on the reflecting pool and see the clouds uh, uh, rolling by. Um, the, the sedums predominated, I think, in October when this photography was done. And it really, uh, really looked beautiful. And then Ed has been going back and forth to this project over the years and has befriended uh, the Library of Congress and the, the maintenance crew and asked them all the time what they're doing. And they have a pretty simple regime of mowing, but it's been pretty effective in, in allowing the, the native perennials to reestablish themselves. This was probably a year or two later, and you can see the, the trees starting to emerge uh, from their tubes. And then here we are today. Uh, this was taken just this last October, so we're pretty pleased with how the, the site has evolved. We already saw the, the green roofs establish themselves and, and do very well, but it's really been important for us to see the native tree and forest canopy beginning to emerge out of these trees. And then I like this picture. Um, this shows the, the tree planting when it first went in that first year, and it looks pretty sterile. And then the lower right, you can see just what it is today. And each one of these tubes has um, a bird protector on it, this little net that they put on top of the tubes, because if the birds get down in these tubes, they can't get back out again. So this was a bird that after the trees had sort of pushed that, uh, that netting out, this bird uh, took it on to, to make a nest out of that material. 
So this uh, roof has come on pretty strong. Uh, Ed probably has uh, more stories about uh, you know the evolution of the uh, uh, sedums and varieties of plants on the roof. Uh, there have been areas that have been more stressed, and, and colonizers have moved into that, and and the the plant matrix matrix has uh, predominantly uh, remained the same. Here's uh, we just photographed this this past. Um, uh, Oct October, and you can see the the forest trees in the foreground emerging uh, to shade the the, uh, the green roofs. So, I guess in in summary, um, we've learned a lot. I think generationally about how to look at uh, landscapes, not just green roofs. I mean, we're landscape architects and problem solvers, and. I think our thinking has changed from this kind of landscape that is really quite beautiful but requires quite a lot of uh, back-end cost. And this is, I think, now the model that we're, we're, we're using more frequently and having greater success with. Um, is this the end? Not really. Uh, we're still working with David Packard, who's uh, actually doing a roof or uh, a complex, if you will, based on a Greek stoa, uh, another uh, archive uh, with UCLA in Southern California. So we've gotten Ed involved, and we're looking at uh, a different mix of plants that are suitable for the Santa Clarita area, um, and that's moving to, uh, along rapidly as we speak. The the cabin, the um the Packard project came into Larry and was his project, and I helped him out when, when we got in trouble. Um, I am kind of had a little bit of a construction background, so uh, when things started sliding down the hill, I got involved and then also got involved when the client decided to do a, um, a reflecting pool uh, in the garden. And so uh, I helped him out on that, and then when this the California Academy project came about, um, Turnabout's fair play, so I got him involved because I was traveling a lot and I needed somebody on the ground locally. Um, so we're going to take a look at the this project uh, in San Francisco. Um, it's it's interesting because of the two projects. The the Library of Congress is kind of unknown. It's unheralded. It's you know this quiet, sleepy place out in the country, and yet it's you know it's a fantastic project and something that we you know that. Uh, has been uh, covered by Linda McIntyre and, and uh, Ed Snodgrass have mentioned it in their in their book. Uh, they've also it's been in uh, Landscape Architecture magazine. So there are resources you can go back and uh, find out a little bit more about that project. Uh, this project, California Academy of Sciences, is very well known, and uh, a lot of it has to do with the, the iconic uh, nature of the form and also the fact that of a big name architect. So it's a building about uh, nature. And um, one of the, it's in a beautiful park. That's the, the one thing that we all love about it, the fact that it, uh, it was a, a facility that was in Golden Gate Park. And uh, at, after an earthquake in 1989, uh, it, we thought that it was actually going to uh, go away. They were talking about moving to another location. Uh, but through public uh, uh, outrage and uh, uh, a lot of commitment by the locals, they were actually able to keep it in, uh, in San Francisco. And the process of, of hiring uh, an architect was quite interesting because uh, they brought in all the various big names. And Renzo Piano was the one architect that came into the project and didn't come in with a preconceived idea. He came in with a blank piece of paper and uh, met with the Board of Trustees and just started drawing in front of them. So uh, one of his ideas was to just pick up a piece of the park and put a building under it. This is the, uh, was the existing museum before the earthquake. Um, it was a, con a, a kind of agglomeration of 11 different buildings. Uh, the first building built in 1916 uh, with the last building uh, built in like 1976. And the Loma Prieta earthquake of uh, 1989 damaged it beyond uh, viable repair. Uh, it's a research facility, not just a, an exhibit. Uh, it has eight scientific research departments and a collection of uh, nearly 18 million scientific specimens. It's been in existence since the 18, middle 1800s. 1863, I think, was the uh, original date of inception. 
a little bit of chronology. Um, I mentioned the earthquake in 1989. Uh, it took uh, 11 years to get to a point of actually starting the design. So uh, with bond measures and uh, the planning process, and then the, the selecting of uh, Renzo Piano uh, in year 2000, we actually were brought onto the project in uh, 2003, which is kind of interesting. Three years of design and conceptualizing had gone by, and uh, I get a call at three in the morning uh, in Tokyo uh, saying, we need you to come work with uh, Renzo Piano on this project, and it was more because we had worked with the uh, owner's representative on several projects in the Bay Area, and we were always the, the consultant that was solving problems that uh, seemed to arise during construction. So the team, um, this is kind of a bridge list of characters. Uh, Renzo Piano, a building workshop out of uh, Genoa, uh, Italy. Uh, Stantec Architecture, it was actually when we started Gordon Chong and Associates, uh, but was purchased by Stantec uh, towards the end of the project. Uh, Arup out of uh, San Francisco, did all of the various uh, engineering systems on the project. Ourselves, uh, many of you know Paul Kephart from Ronald Creek. He was actually involved with the, with the project before SWA and was, uh, as you'll see in uh, some of the later slides, was doing some uh, studies uh, at the existing facility before they uh, demoed it. And then uh, Dixon Associates was our irrigation uh, consultant and then uh, various engineers and, and the, the landscape subcontractor was uh, Jensen Corporation. So conceptually, it's a planar roof that morphed to fit the, the uh, functions under it. And so conceptually, it was, uh, we think, brilliantly simple. Uh, the uh, architect, Renzo Piano, loved the elevation of the existing roof and wanted to maintain that. And so there was a planetarium to put in the building, and they wanted to do this biosphere, rainforest biosphere. So they basically put those elements where they needed to be and then pushed the roof down over it. This uh, are cross sections to the building. Uh, the east-west section, you see the uh, planetarium on the left and the rainforest biosphere on the right. Uh, there's the piazza in the center, uh, which is a, really is a light weld, so they would have daylighting into the center of the building. The north-south section shows the research on the south side, the research facility. There's uh, four floors of uh, collections and research happening there. Uh, again, the section through the piazza showing how the daylighting works uh, in the center of the building. This was an early sketch on just exactly how that roof and that piazza would work. Um, you get a convection current happening with cool air dropping down into that centerpiece, hot air rising in the domes and being exhausted through uh, uh, porthole skylights. Uh, and then the environmental strategies that they were looking at in the building, it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, everything from the Venturi effect that I mentioned with uh, the air dropping down in and the, the a hot air rising, um, the roof geometry uh, provides that. And then the glass canopy that was all the way around the building uh, that had the PV cells in it. Um, it's predominantly concrete, so it stays relatively uh, even temperatured throughout the year. And then all the operable skylights and, and uh, vents that allow the uh, uh, air currents to move through the building. And then the radiant floor heating, um, which was an interesting uh, aspect to the building. This was a, uh, they did beautiful wood models while this thing was being designed. This, the, they were actually made in, in France, I believe. Uh, this just shows the, the idea of the uh, suspended glass canopy in the, in the uh, rectangular opening of the building. A piazza, we made the mistake of calling it a plaza one time and were scolded um, that a plaza is Spanish and piazza is Italian. Uh, and this was, it was very complicated. I don't know what was spent on this thing. As Larry mentioned, this project was nearly uh, half a billion dollars, $488 million project. The core, the building itself was $280 million, and then the fit, the fit and finish of all the exhibits and everything else uh, brought the thing up to $488 million, I believe, and that didn't include the design, the design fees. So there's a, a set of three different systems of screens on this. There's a sunscreen, an acoustic screen, and a rain screen. And we'll 
talk about that a little bit later. But these are some of the uh, sustainability highlights. Um, the roof contributed considerably, you know, with the with the natural light and ventilation for the shape of the roof and the, and the piazza. Um, there was energy savings relative to the the fact that the green roofs mistakenly are thought to be insulation and they're not. The engineer wouldn't consider the green roof uh, as allowing, providing any R value because for it to be successful, it was going to be uh, moist and wet soil doesn't give you an R value, but it would keep the concrete cool so they could include it in their cooling uh, load calculations and loads. Demolition. Um, 90% of all the demolition materials were recycled, so you can see how clean the thing was, and what was left over was this one little wall from Africa Hall on the lower left-hand corner uh, that was uh, it, historical, but uh, hysterical at the same time. And then um, the, the, the one thing that this Everybody has realized that this has this kind of iconic green roof, but in reality, we were dealing with other uh, on-structure issues. We had a parking garage that was built in front of the project that nobody even knows. They know that it's there when they drive in to park, but they don't realize it's there when they're up on the uh, entering the building. And so that was a, a, an intensive landscape, and then uh, the extensive landscape on the uh, the roof itself. The two other elements there that I want to point out are the exhibit garden, uh, which was the observation deck uh, that gave us uh, lead uh, credit for um, uh, what was an innovative design. And then also I wanted to point out the mock-up. Uh, we'll see some images of a 48 by 24 foot section of the roof that had some of the most interesting curves in it that they uh, wanted to build off-site to look at the constructability of, of the, the roof. These are some of the statistics. I won't go through them uh, point by point, but uh, it was a very, very expensive roof. Uh, it's two and a half acres, and it was cost us about $2 million. So the, it, it came out to be $19 a square foot. The plant trays that you'll see delivered uh, later in some of the images uh, were, that came from Rana Creek were uh, $9 per square foot. This uh, is probably the, one of the, th the things that's most important about the roof to us and to San Francisco. We have a combined uh, storm drain and sewer system. They're in the same pipes, and so it's, it's very taxed during the the winter time on his very old system. Um, so the six inch media uh, as designed uh, would uh, retain about a half a gallon of water per square foot. So during our rainy season, there's two months that exceed the media field capacity. And so we were only potentially dumping 80,000 gallons of water into that uh, old system. But in reality, we ended up putting it into a groundwater recharge chamber. Uh, and so we're really not affecting the, the drainage system whatsoever. So uh, many of you may know Paul Kephart, uh, Rana Creek Living Architecture. Uh, he, as I mentioned, he did mock-ups uh, at the existing facility before it closed. Uh, he identified a list of 25 plants, native plants, that were candidates for the uh, roof. Uh, the highlighted uh, plants uh, were the select few, and that was mainly because uh, of the biomass and the height and the, the Renzo Piano eventually saying he didn't want a shaggy European roof. He wanted something more manicured that would really highlight the form of the roof. These are our, the, the Fab Four perennials. Um, the strawberry and the self-heal became the dominant species the armeria and the sedum kind of took second uh, seat and uh, ended up uh, with some difficulty uh, in the end. The annuals, the five annuals that you see there, um, uh, were seeded in uh, just before delivery. So this is the mock-up that I mentioned, the off-site mock-up. Uh, and this was done more for the constructability of the roof. It wasn't really done for our benefit. But since they were building it, we took advantage of it. Um, 
you can see the four different phases there. They wanted to see, they wanted to check and see if they could actually bend the steel the way they wanted it to be bent. And then they had to do the plywood forming and, and shotcrete the roof. They wanted to test building the skylights. Uh, and then we got to use it for our green roof testing. So this just shows a little time lapse of, of that uh, green roof. Um, it, it allowed us to uh, test the assemblage and the performance of the of the gabion uh, uh, intercept drains, and then you saw the perennials being individually planted, and then you see the flush of the of the uh, overseeded annuals, and then this is what we were left with, which uh, we likened to a um, what was it a tumbleweed on stilts? I think is what they. They, and this scared the architects tremendously when they viewed this thing. They had shut off the irrigation. You can see some disturbance up in the right-hand corner. That's where they were actually looking at how they were going to flash and detail the skylights. So there was a disturbance in that media. Uh, but what came out of this is they didn't want to do the annuals. They kind of said, we're just going to stick to the perennials. And that, uh, that story actually changed too. This is the roof again, a uh, very simple uh, design with a 24-foot grid that was throughout the building structurally, even on the ground, all the concrete patterning, everything was to this module. And then this is the program that's uh, under the building with the planetarium on the left and the rainforest on the right, the piazza in the center, uh, and the, the uh, entrance to the Steinhardt Aquarium in the back uh, near the, the, uh, the south lobby. This is the, uh, the, uh, a diagram that showed the steel that was specially shaped, the blue, the blue steel. Uh, it's a company in Utah that makes roller coasters, so this was all uh, specially rolled material. Uh, it was actually quite beautiful. It's a shame to cover it up, I think, sometimes. Um, this just shows the steel installation. Uh, I show this mainly because we'll talk a little bit this afternoon about uh, a project in China and the job sites that look considerably different over there. Uh, anybody that's worked in China knows that it's a bit of a disaster on a construction site. And then this was the uh, formwork inside. The flat areas of the roof actually were steel deck and uh, very easily uh, built. And then the areas that were all uh, curved and shaped uh, were wood formed and uh, shot created onto that wood formwork. And then this is the uh, just before they were sh shot creating, they're uh, setting in the rebar and putting in the uh, styrofoam plugs for the skylights. And we just thought it was very, very interesting. So this is what it reminded us of. If anybody's a, a fan of Disney and Fantasia and Tchaikovsky's. Uh, uh, Chinese dance. Then this is the actual shot creating operation. Um, uh, the the I think the skylights were the most interesting thing because they were shot afterwards and then you know all hand shaped and um, worked out actually quite well because it had to be very very precise when you see the 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 skylight. Uh, themselves and how they operate uh, later, uh, you understand how critical it was that these things were in the right place and built to be uh, uh, round. This shows the waterproofing and some of the, uh, the uh, protection board going on, uh, and then also the water testing where they were able to dam the flat areas and then they put 24-hour spray systems on the domes to test the, the dome uh, waterproofing integrity. Uh, the rigid insulation, uh, there was no insulation going on the inside of the domes uh, because he wanted to, uh, Renzo wanted to see the roof form inside and didn't want to, to have to add that layer inside. And then the flat areas that were over the other uh, exhibit, exhibition spaces, the insulation could go on the inside. So we had kind of a half and half uh, treatment system here in terms of insulation. And then all along at Rana Creek down in Carmel, south of San Francisco, um, they were propagating material and uh, growing uh, cutting stock, uh, putting them in the, uh, into the propagules, uh, getting the, the um, reviewing sample trays. So this was several, um, uh, several reviews uh, and junkets to down to look at this material and actually see how, how this was going. And at this time, uh, you'll see here on the lower right, 
this was the two and a half acres of uh, material laid out. And it was a meeting with, uh, at the site with Renzo Piano where he asked Paul to come up with a, a pre-grown module versus uh, hand planting because he just thought he wanted more of an instant effect. But he wasn't in a, of a mind to use any sort of plastic on the roof. He was dead setting as using any kind of a plastic tray. Uh, so uh, necessity is the mother of invention and, and uh, Paul took a standard nursery tray, plastic nursery tray, and just took coconut choir and formed this um, bio tray, which he's still using today. This is just a, a cutaway section of how the, the uh, uh, living roof is uh, built up. Uh, pretty simple from the insulation to the filter fabric reservoir board. Uh, filter fabric again, the media, three inches of media, and then the three inches uh, that came in the tray for a total of six inches section of uh, media. That cutaway actually wasn't something that we developed for the to sell the project or represent the project was something that was done later to uh, put in a book. And this, uh, if, if you're interested, this is a, a relatively new book on the market. And I understand it's becoming quite popular in, with the, in the landscape architecture curriculum. This came out of our Los Angeles office. These are the components. Um, the, uh, you can see the reservoir board. The rebar that you see up there, the green rebar is epoxy coated. Uh, we use that to actually stiffen the gabion intercept uh, uh, channels. Uh, we, the gabions are three feet long, 10 inches wide, uh, and the depth of eight inches because they sit in the uh, insulation uh, two inches. And then you see the choir trays. And the white strapping that in the lower left-hand corner was our methodology for securing this whole thing. They wouldn't let us attach anything to the roof. They didn't want to build any curbs to hold anything. They wanted the waterproofing to be just one continuous uh, smooth sheet. So uh, our uh, solution to that was to do this gabion grid, but we had to somehow hang it. So we used the uh, gabions on one side of the domes to counterbalance gabions on the other side. So we used this cord strap to actually create a, a net. So here you see the a progression of, of a, a mock-up that we did on the site. And this was only done because Renzo was coming to town and they wanted to show him some progress on what uh, the roof might look like. So they very quickly sodded some trays and laid this thing up. And it was actually a very good exercise for the contractor. Uh, one of the things that we talked about doing originally was laying these trays up in a brick fashion. Uh, in a running bond, and we found out that that was going to be more problematic than uh, worthwhile. So we went back to a stack bond because we didn't have to cut all the trays. This is just showing you the layering, insulation, filter fabric through the um, uh, the gabion, and the uh, you can see the insulation in the lower right-hand corner incised for the uh, the gabion trays, uh, the gabion intercept curves to be laid in, which is interesting because that all had to be done with a survey group because they didn't really trust the landscape contractor to lay out those lines. This is just more installation. You can see how the rebar was used to stiffen those rows of gabions. The gabions are like links in a chain, they don't stay very straight, so we had to, to force them to stay straight. And then you can see the cord strap in the, in the background that creates that netting that goes up and over. This is cord straps used in ship cargo shipping industry to strap down containers. So it's got a huge uh, 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 weight capacity. Uh, the reservoir board with showing how it does hold water. Uh, some irrigation details since in the thin section we were very adamant to have fittings go uh, pipes crossing over with fittings and not having pipe laying on pipe and creating issues in the future. This is the soiling, uh, the putting the media on the roof, uh, the three inch layer before the trays came in. Uh, you can see the irrigation system being tested before the plants were brought out. It's kind of, it's not a great idea to put plants down and then find out your irrigation system isn't functioning properly. And then the delivery of the the pre-grown trays, which uh, was part of Paul Kephart's contract to grow this material. So he got 
a bunch of old bakery trays, um, 44 trays per, or 44 of the bio trays per bakery rack, 27 racks per truckload, 1,200 trays per truckload, um, and then we lifted them onto the roof with the, the shark cages. This is the, the tray chain gang, we call this. This is actually the installation, and they, uh, everybody was roped together because as they, every time they turned around to lay a tray, and this is probably something learned on desal, working on a slope, you get disoriented, turning around, lifting, and we had people, actually workers, throwing up on a regular basis because they were getting dizzy. And then we ran into this, what we call slopes of a third kind, where we were doing this 45 degree uh, installation of the media and it just wouldn't stay on the filter fabric, it just sliding to the bottom. So a whole another set of uh, gabion intercepts were installed, but these were, were actually underneath the, the final tray layer, so they just disappeared uh, because we couldn't ruin that 24 foot grid. Uh, the trays, as they were first laid, and you see the perennials are there, uh, five per tray, and the, they had been overseeded, so you're now seeing the, the, the first flush of some of the gold fields and tidy tips coming in the lower right. And then this is just progression of growth. Um, you can see on the lower left the skylights uh, opening up, and that was what was interesting about the building. As the building would heat up, these were all uh, temperature controlled and the building would just start to move like like a sea urchin. Uh, this is the, uh, in the first first summer, I think, we're getting some of the, the poppy coming in and the, you can see some gold fields and gold tips in there, tidy tips. And then the, 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 the uh, plant material that became the kind of the winner of the race was the prunella, the self-heal. It's just more of the same. You can see how this was in there first. And one of the things that was great for us is that they finished the total construction of the building one year before opening. So we were totally planted out and uh, growing before uh, this was even something that the public saw because they needed a, a year to fit out the interior exhibits, the aquaria and all of the rest of the, uh, the building. This is the observation deck with the elevator coming up. Uh, it's interesting in this is the, it, the accents in orange were uh, Renzo's idea. He liked the Golden Gate Bridge and wanted the orange accents, and then he got up there and decided he didn't like it. So you'll see later photos where that orange frame of the elevator actually disappears. This is our um, LEED certification. You're probably very familiar with this. You have Gold Star, but I assume many of you have worked in the, in the LEED program. The highlighted letters are the the different categories that you score points or credits in. These were the various credits that we were trying to achieve on the on the roof for the certification and then here's our scorecard and how we did and one of the things that was amenable is that we did very very well with the landscape issues here. We've got 14 out of 16 maximum credits and you see the energy and atmosphere part of the built which is part of the building didn't do as well and that was because the building the system isn't really designed for specific buildings. This has a lot of energy use in the building because of the, the living exhibits, the aquaria and the biosphere. It just uses a huge amount of energy. So it's very hard to reach those credits when you've got a specialty building uh, like a museum. This is, uh, uh, you see the, the kind of going away from the roof. You still see the, the very, very prominent grid. We thought this would disappear in time. Uh, Renzo wanted it to disappear. That's why we were limited to this 10-inch width on the gabion. Um, this is a little bit closer look. You see the piazza on the right. The, the number of skylights on the left are because of the biosphere and the amount of daylight and UV they wanted in the rainforest. And the, there's fewer skylights on the planetarium side just for ventilation purposes. This is kind of flying out. And then you see the juxtaposition of the museum next to the music concourse and off to the right is the, which you can't see, and you can see it here, the dark brown building, copper clad building is the Fine Arts Museum, uh, Herzog de Muron, 
uh, building. And so we're very, very happy to have two very iconic pieces of architecture in Golden Gate Park. And you see the, the Golden Gate Bridge in the distance, so we're not lying about where it, it is. And there's our city uh, on the eastern horizon with the Golden Gate Panhandle going out on the right side. And then this was uh, opening day and a closer look at opening day. It actually, somebody said it looked like an insect colony. So it's, as a natural history museum, it's uh, quite appropriate. And you can see the observation deck, uh, which has a capacity of 200 people, uh, and the elevator is no longer orange, it's gray. And we, had the, we have the luxury, since it's in our backyard, to actually go back and see what's happening. And one of the nice things about this, and something that Paul really wanted to do from the beginning, was it to be more diverse. Um, we started with nine plants. We added 40 plants around the exhi uh, exhibit uh, deck uh, to show the, the, the diversity and what the various native plants could do in, the, in a uh, thin, uh, extensive roof. And now we've been told by the stewards of the project that there are nearly 80 species, native species up there. Uh, this, these are the stewards. Uh, they have two full-time staff. Alan Good is the landscape exhibit supervisor and Kendra is his assistant. Uh, they have the maintenance for the entire seven and a half acre site is only two people two days a week that they contract with. Uh, and the rest of the landscape maintenance, specifically the roof, is all volunteers. They have a waiting list for people that want to actually work on this uh, green roof, which was fantastic because it does require quite a bit of, of maintenance, but it's being done um, uh, mostly by people that want to participate. This is just up on the deck when we met with Alan just before coming to Australia. We wanted to kind of touch bases with him uh, in, uh, uh, in um, Ed's book. He mentioned, you know, interviewing Linda and Ed have talked to Alan many times and he's been very good about uh, being critical and we deserve it because as Ed mentioned that a lot of the design has to happen talking about and thinking about maintenance and one of the things that we didn't really understand as well is just materials going up and down to this facility and the fact that the museum, you know, is functioning. 24-7 pretty much and they have to get materials up to the roof and there is the only the single elevator that people are using so it does cause issues. There's Larry, myself and Alan and Kendra uh, looking at a um, actually a, a manual that they developed a simple manual that they give to the volunteers to pull weeds so they know what they're what they're doing and then these are some of the natives that have come in, the California fuchsia and uh, various uh, yarrows, that Achillea, that's come in. And this is just how beautiful it really is up there now. You still see a little bit remnant of the gabions. They use the gabions for footpaths to, to, to actually maintain the garden, and they like the fact that it gives them some, almost a, uh, a checkered census of what's going on in the various uh, quadrants of the building. And this is really what it's all about. Um, the fact that it is a museum and the fact that we have a lot of children experiencing what uh, Renzo coined as a soft machine is really quite brilliant because I think there was a, a local columnist that uh, likes to eavesdrop and I guess in one of the first months that she was visiting uh, the academy after it opened, she heard some husband and wife uh, talking, and the wife said, so it's a green roof, let's go. You know, didn't hold her attention very long. And then that she overheard a little boy talking to his uh, father and said, Dad, why don't we have plants on our roof? And, and that's what uh, it's all about, is kind of fostering that, the idea in, the, in these younger generations that there's a different way of looking at, at things. And, so with that, I think we're getting pretty close to wanting to eat, so.